So now uh, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce our last plenary speaker of the morning, Stanislav Groth. And whose reputation precedes him. Um, he'll be doing a plenary session on psychedelics and the future of humanity. And then after our break, uh, we'll take a somewhat truncated break because we're running a bit behind, um, he'll uh, be doing in the clinical track here uh, a talk on the implications of consciousness research for psychiatry, psychology, and psychotherapy. So um, <laughs> I have to admit that I was asked to pare the bios down to just a few sentences. Um, I refused, uh, I, I, and you'll see why in a second. Um, Stanislav Grof, MD, is a psychiatrist with over 60 years of research experience in non-ordinary states of consciousness and one of the founders and chief theoreticians of transpersonal psychology. He was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia, where he also received his scientific training, an MD degree from the Charles University School of Medicine and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in medicine from the Czechoslovakian Academy of Sciences. Dr. Groff's early research in the clinical uses of psychedelic substances was conducted at the Psychiatric Research Institute in Prague, where he conducted thousands, almost 10,000, I think, psychedelic sessions over a number of years. Um, uh, he was principal investigator of a program that systematically explored the heuristic and therapeutic potential of LSD and other psychedelic substances. In 1967, he was invited as clinical and research fellow to the Johns Hopkins University and the research unit of Spring Grove Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, interesting how Johns Hopkins was the last man standing in the 60s and uh, one of the first and biggest uh, research uh, facilities now. Um, and the research unit of Spring Grove Hospital at Baltimore. In 1969, he became an assistant professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University and continued his research as chief of psychiatric research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Institute um, in 1973, Dr. Groff was invited to the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, where he developed, with his uh, late wife, Christina Groff, holotropic breathwork, an innovative form of experimental psychotherapy, developed in part to, uh, in due to the changed legal status of LSD. And that's, uh, that is now being used worldwide. Dr. Groff is the founder of the International Transpersonal Association. You see why I couldn't cut this down. Um, and for several decades served as its president. In 1993, he received an honorary degree from the Association for Transpersonal Psychology for major contributions to and development of the field of transpersonal psychology, <clears throat> excuse me, given on the occasion of the 25th anniversary, their 25th anniversary convocation. In 2007, he received the prestigious Vision 97 Lifetime Achievement Award from the foundation of Dagmar and Valasev Havel in che Prague, Czechoslovakia, and has received numerous other awards uh, for his pivotal contributions to the field. Among Dr. Groff's publications are over 150 articles in professional journals and the books LSD, Gateway to the Numinous, Beyond the Brain, LSD Psychotherapy, The Cosmic Game, Psychology of the Future, uh, The Ultimate Journey, several others, um, uh, and the last, the, the, these three, Modern Consciousness Research and the Understanding of Art, The Stormy uh, Search for the Self and Spiritual Emergence and Holotropic Breathwork, the last three of which were written with um, his late wife, Christina. Um, these books have been translated into 23 languages. Um, as a psychologist, I want to just say that um, Dr. Groff has been um, a, a bit of a hero of mine and the most well-known um, psychological, psychiatric voice over the decades in this field. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce him and to turn him over to you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, before I start talking, I would like to thank uh, Rick Dublin and MAPS for this incredible work in the last uh, four decades of um, moving from a situation where it was virtually impossible to do psychedelic research to this unbelievable global renaissance that's happening. And uh, I don't know how you did it, uh, you and your staff, but it's just uh, unbelievably impressive. Uh, so Rick asked me to use about half an hour this morning to talk about uh, the, the potential of, of psychedelics, not just from an individual perspective, but also uh, from a global perspective. So if we look at uh, human history, um, 
we see two very powerful forces driving it. Uh, one is uh, insatiable greed, acquisitiveness, and the other one is uh, unbridled aggression. And this has been happening since the shift from the um, hunters and gatherers to uh, the development of, of cities and agriculture, where there was possible to accumulate uh, possessions. Uh, so this, this has been there through you know, centuries. Now, in uh, the 20th century and the 21st century, uh, these forces became really dangerous. You know, in the past, they, they certainly uh, were destructive for the, for the human groups uh, that was involved, but it was not damaging the planet. But what happened in the, in the last 100 years uh, with the in incredible uh, population explosion, with the escalation of uh, industrial uh, productivity, uh, the unbelievable pollution that's happening uh, by the increase of violence uh, on a global scale. So we are now facing a situation where uh, the survival of the human species is uh, really threatened. And uh, very likely we would take a few other species uh, with us. So the question is, um, uh, is there anything we can do about it? So what has been done so far, the <clears throat> military interventions, <clears throat> the economic uh, sanctions, diplomatic, uh, political sanctions, if anything, have created more problems than the South. And um, the famous statement by Albert Einstein is, you cannot solve the problems using the same type of thinking that got you into the trouble in the, in the first place. It requires some kind of radically uh, different approach. So the question is, what, what can we do? I think people in transversal circles see that we are facing a global crisis, but which has many symptoms, but ultimately there is a common denominator to all of them, which is the, the state of evolution of the human species. If we uh, were a sort of different kind of species, if we had hearts and heads in a different place, uh, we could solve the problems uh, in the world. There's enough resources, there is enough know-how, uh, so the question is how we, how we use these uh, resources. Now, if you look at uh, spiritual history, then um, many of the spiritual teachers agree that you cannot sort of reach inner peace, you cannot uh, reach happiness by uh, acquisition of some external material um, means, whether it's property, money, power, fame, state, it requires something else, it requires a, a profound transformation of consciousness. So the question is, what kind of transformation would it be? Uh, how could it be achieved? So I would like to talk about the experiences I have had, uh, the changes that I have seen um, you know, over the last 60 years in people who were involved in responsible uh, use, uh, experimentation with, uh, with psychedelics. Now, talking about it, I use uh, a very famous uh, uh, Tibetan Tanka, which, which uh, summarizes somehow the basic ideas of uh, Mahayana Buddhism in, in Tibet. Now, this is a <clears throat> Tanka that is showing the wheel of life, which is held in grip by uh, the Lord of Death. Um, the, cir the circle uh, his, in the middle is divided into six segments. These are called lokas. These are the areas into which supposedly can be reborn after death. But they also are uh, areas which we can experience in, in uh, systematic uh, spiritual uh, practice. And they're also uh, an archetypal domains that then get projected into the, into the world. So if we go uh, to the top, we see the, the realm of devas, devaloka, gods. Then if we go uh, clockwise, this is the uh, realm of asuras or jealous gods who are in constant um, 
fight with the with the gods like what we see in uh, in um, Greece the, the the titans against the Olympic gods and so on uh, then the next one is a great uh, realm which is the realm of the pretas they're called hungry ghosts they are very pitiful creatures with big bellies and and tiny um, uh, mouth which is the size of a, of a pinhead so they can never never get enough so to a great extent this is archetype running the industrial uh, civilization now among others then if we go uh, further down this is the realm of of uh, hell uh, Nara, Nara Loka, uh, which also has the scene of judgment I will not talk about the details about it uh, um, I want to get to the center so the next one, if we go, this is the realm of uh, uh, animals, of wild beasts, a realm that's governed by very base instincts. And then the next one, like 11 o'clock, is the Manakaloka, which is the human realm, where you supposedly have the best chances for enlightenment. You have the necessary uh, resources. Now, in the, in the middle of the circle, we can see three animals. This is the pig, uh, the snake, and a rooster. And they represent what in Tibetan Buddhism is called uh, the three poisons. These are the three forces that supposedly keep us uh, on, on the wheel of rebirth and are causes of all suffering uh, in the world. So the pig represents ignorance, uh, avidya. And the snake represents uh, aggression violence, and the rooster represents uh, desire, lust, uh, that leads then to uh, attachment. Okay. So those are the three Tibetan poisons. Now in <clears throat> Hinayana Buddhism, which is the Buddhism of the small vehicle, the original teaching of the Buddha, um, the idea was as long as you are in what's called samsaric world, you're incarnate, um, you will be suffering. And the, the initial idea, would have, you want to get completely off the wheel. You have to get into the realm which is beyond uh, creation, which is uh, nirvana. The term nirvana is related to the Sanskrit vata, which means wind. So what it means is evanescence, extinguishing of the torches of light moving into realm beyond existence now then <clears throat> during the history of buddhism uh, a different form developed which is called mahayana the the large vehicle buddhism of the large vehicle where the idea was different the, the idea was that you can move in the relationship in the direction of uh, liberation of nirvana to the extent to which you can reduce the impact of these three forces in your life ignorance violence anger aggression and desire and this insatiable uh, desire okay so i'd like to talk about how using responsible use of psychedelic can help us to reduce the the, the, the three forces that are seen as as really the main sources of suffering in the world <clears throat> so if you look at the pig, which is ignorance, so when we use, uh, again, systematically responsibly psychedelics, we get a lot of new information. We can, for example, get access to repressed and forgotten material from our childhood, the things that happened in infancy childhood that make our life difficult. Um, we can, uh, something that's not... Uh, accepted in current psychology, psychiatry, we can actually relieve our birth. We can decide how much suffering in our life is determined by the fact that we carry uh, unprocessed uh, memory of birth with all the difficult uh, emotions and the difficult uh, physical energies which are blocked in the body. We can even find uh, the prenatal causes of difficulties that we have. And we can not only discover them, but we can go there, we can bring them into consciousness, we can process now the emotions, we can free ourselves from that powerful negative uh, program, which is the perinatal, prenatal, and postnatal. 
But it goes beyond this. There's a category of experiences that we call transpersonal, where we can have experiential identification with other people, uh, which is members of other species, even, even in the bot botanical realm. We can discover a lot of uh, things, sort of information that goes way beyond anything that we, that we uh, know intellectually. We can identify with different animals and we can, by becoming them, we can get deep, deep understanding of what, uh, what uh, their experience of the world is. Now, avidya, that term which is used in uh, the Buddhist tradition, does not mean ignorance in terms of having a lack of uh, information about the material world. The term avidya ultimately is about something else, which is um, our lack of understanding of the nature of reality and lack of understanding of who we really are. This is a, a knowledge that has nothing to do with concrete knowledge, information about the material world. It has to do with the fact that there are normally um, invisible or imperceptible dimensions of reality that uh, play extremely important role in uh, the life that we are leading. We, we are not aware that those dimensions exist. Uh, we also uh, can discover very different uh, information about the nature of, of ourselves, who we are. Are we really just Newtonian objects? Are we really just body egos? Or are we something much larger? So this is, this is the kind of uh, uh, knowledge that can counteract the avidya, this fundamental ignorance about the nature of reality and, and who we are. And this is something that becomes available in uh, psychedelic experiences or the whole category of experiences which I call holotropic means that uh, help us to move towards wholeness. Holos means um, whole and trepein, trepo, trepein means moving toward wholeness. So what's behind it is the idea that ultimately each of us uh, carries a, kind of a uh, spark of uh, cosmic creative energy which in Hinduism is called uh, Atman, and that we can uh, reach that in, in systematic self-exploration. In Hinduism, of course, it's using the different yogas, but psychedelics certainly are a means to achieve that. So we can experience and, and uh, empirically validate the fact that our deepest nature is not Nama Rupa, name and shape, <clears throat> uh, but uh, Atman, this core of cosmic energy. And when we experience it, we realize that that energy is identical with the energy that created the universe, which is then called uh, Brahman. We are not uh, Nama Rupa, we are not body egos, we are uh, ultimately uh, Atman, Brahman. And that knowledge is not available and becomes available in the work with uh, non ordinary states of, uh, states of consciousness. I wanted to st tell a story about Jack Cornfield. You know, one of the things in Buddhism is uh, there's no separate self. A lot of the suffering in the world is that we identify with um, sort of autonomous separate self. And uh, Jack Cornfield tells a story when he met Kalu Rinpoche as a very eager student of uh, Buddhism and wanted to use that opportunity. So he asked uh, Kalu Rinpoche, can you uh, just in a few words, uh, tell me what, what is the essence of Buddhism? And Kalu Rinpoche says, well, I could tell you, but you wouldn't believe me, and it would take you a very long time to understand what I mean. And Jack said, please tell me anyway. And Kalu Rinpoche says, okay, you don't really exist. <laughs> Which means not you don't exist, you know, something exists, but it's not what you think it is. It's not the body ego. So this is the kind of uh, uh, knowledge that we get that counteracts the avidya, and this is called uh, prajna paramita, transcendental wisdom. Now, if we look at the second uh, poison, which is aggression. Again, um, for any any of you who have done psychedelics know that we can process a lot of aggression. We see it also in the holotropic breathwork. So there are this aggression which is associated with traumatic 
postnatal history. There is enormous amount of aggression that is uh, that is stored from the time of birth. The all the uh, response, aggressive response to the hours of suffocation and the, the passage through the birth canal. There, uh, there is uh, anger that might be associated with prenatal trauma. And then we find also transpersonal sources of, of aggression in this kind of uh, exploration. Uh, one of them being uh, past life experiences, karmic experiences. We can also uh, get uh, in touch with archetypes that are aggressive archetypes. Um, you know that the archetype realm is dichotomized. There are these dark deities, light deities. Uh, there are also grand uh, uh, archetypal um, scenes like uh, Apocalypse, you know, uh, Ragnarok, the Doom of the Gods, and so on. So enormous amount of, of aggression on all those levels: postnatal, perinatal, prenatal, and and transpersonal. Uh, none of it is really uh, available for processing if we use verbal psychotherapy. Once we get to pre-verbal and from then on, this, is, this cannot be handled by talking. This, the powerful experiential methods are the only way of uh, addressing that. And we see enormous amount of uh, aggression that becomes available and can be processed with the proper support in in uh, psychedelic sessions, so that <clears throat> you can see people really becoming uh, much more peaceful, uh, developing a sense of compassion and sense of connection uh, with the world, appreciation uh, for the world, and so on. Uh, so that's a that is a great great uh, potential of psychedelics to really uh, get rid of, get rid of these pockets of aggression that we carry in the unconscious. Uh, <clears throat> then we uh, get to the next one, which is the, uh, what's symbolized by the rooster, which is this, this endless acquisitiveness and, and greed and sort of desire to have more. And this is uh, something that's very typical for uh, an average person who hasn't done some significant inner work, that we always want more than we have. And things are not, uh, never sort of good enough. We don't, you know, we don't uh, look good enough, we don't have enough uh, uh, possessions, enough money, we don't have enough power, we don't have enough, uh, enough um, status. And this is uh, something that cannot be solved by more acquisitions. We see people who have, you know, billions of dollars of everything that we think would make us happy, but they are not exactly levitating in bliss, uh, you know, they're not. And we don't learn. We think that if you know, it would not happen to us if we can improve our economic status, uh, that uh, the life would actually change. Uh, so the question is, where does this drive come from? So one of the things that we discover is the fact that we carry uh, undigested, unprocessed uh, memory of birth. You know, on some level, we still live in the birth canal. We were born anatomically. We got out of it, but we have not really processed the, the, the hours of, of pain and fear that we experience in the birth canal. So uh, we see, for example, even in the breath work, not just psychedelics, you can, you can breathe faster for half an hour and you find yourself in the birth canal instead of uh, in the room where you are doing the, the breath work. So if it becomes so easily available, like in everyday life, um, then the question is to what extent it's actually coloring our uh, quality of life, to what extent, some extent we have not really stepped out, we have not accepted the fact that we are already uh, in the world. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one of the major patterns, that, that, uh, that sense of dissatisfaction and then the feeling that something better is in the future is the, is the pattern, unfinished pattern of birth. That we are in the birth canal, things are not great. You see, you want to get to some better situation in the future. And you already have the memory that it happened. You got out of the birth canal, but we still carry all the memories. The, the little, little crying that happens when we are born is, is uh, trivial as compared to what it would require to really process all the pent-up emotions and the, the um, 
physical energies that are blocked from that type. So <clears throat> uh, this creates that kind of a drive that the, we don't, uh, uh, we are not satisfied with how things are. We create a, an image of some better future when we have more money, when we have a bigger car, you know, a bigger house, uh, when we have more power, when we have more, more fame and so on. And this is a this is a loser's pattern. Whether whether we are achieving it or not, it doesn't really do anything psychologically. Um, so uh, you you um, would project somehow uh, the future goal that would bring the correction, some kind of image of what I need to really feel happy, and then uh, we we set our uh, our uh, life on a kind of linear pursuit towards that goal. And then there are two possibilities. We don't achieve the goal, and then we feel that you know, um, the reason why we don't feel happy is because, because we haven't achieved the, the correction. And the other one, we achieve it, and then we wake up in the morning, and uh, the old world is still there. So we don't say, this is a loser strategy. I have to do something significantly different. The, the goal was not big enough. It's not, it's not uh, you know, Hundred thousand, it's million dollars. So, uh, it's not one doctorate; it's two two doctorates that we need, and so on. <clears throat> so this is what Joseph Campbell called getting to the top of the ladder and finding that it was against the wrong wall. Okay. <laughs> so the people who uh, uh, relief birth, who get a sense of how power, what a powerful, irrational program it is in our lives, they. <clears throat> start seeing retrospectively their life as what they, what they talk about as rat race or, or um, a treadmill kind of lifestyle, like the hamster who was in a, in a uh, with this, uh, circle, sort of running and not getting anywhere, always sort of pursuing something, something to the future. So this gets significantly reduced when we can uh, relief, this, this uh, driving force that's associated with the unfinished business of birth, but not completely. There's still enough of the, of the ego drive uh, left. And so the question where is that coming from? Um, Ken Wilber wrote a book, uh, The Sociable, Sociable God, uh, an Atman project, when uh, he talks about the fact uh, that, uh, according to perennial philosophy, our true identity is with, with Atman, Atman Brahman. It's not the body ego. So uh, when we are incarnate, we lost that sense of who we are, uh, but uh, we are left with uh, some kind of a vague feeling that we should be something much, much bigger. And uh, there's no way we can achieve that in, uh, when we are incarnate in uh, the material world. We would have to be it all, we would have to have it all to really reach our true status, cosmic status. So the only solution then is to actually experience one's own divinity uh, and then, you know, the real nature of uh, reality. And then we can return to whatever role we are playing in, in this life. But we have this larger meta framework. We know that we are something much, much lar uh, larger uh, and it's not just a vague feeling that we should have more and we should be more, but we have, have, we have experienced that sense of uh, identity, who we are. So it becomes like a meta framework that helps us to deal, deal with uh, life. Okay. okay, so I have just a list of things uh, that I have seen in people who have done responsible uh, work with psychedelic. So the most uh, relevant thing for me, because I started as a clinical psychiatrist, is what you can do with psychedelics therapeutically. And we can certainly go way beyond any uh, you know, uh, potential of, of uh, means that we have already available, like verbal therapy, or certainly not tranquilizers, you know, a lot of uh, current Psychiatry is limited to suppressing symptoms, and it's called therapy. There is, it's nothing else but mitigation of symptoms. It doesn't change really anything. Where psychedelics can take us to the core, where the problems are coming from. We can really resolve 
some things. So this is the whole big, big category. Rick talked about it and, you know, we've written about it for, for years. There is an enormous therapeutic potential if psychedelics are used uh, properly. Then I already talked about significant decrease of aggression. And you see emergence of compassion in people. People feel connected uh, with other people, feel connected with the world. Uh, when we read about industrial civilization, one word that comes again and again is alienation. We are alienated from our bodies, we are alienated from uh, each other, we are alienated from nature, we are alienated from the cosmos, we are uh, alienated from the spiritual. So one of the things that happen is a sense of connectedness. Uh, Victor Turner, who is an English uh, uh, anthropologists studied the ritual life of native cultures and uh, his conclusion was that, uh, that uh, experiencing together non-ordinary states of consciousness, which is always happening in these rituals, uh, uh, creates a sense of communitas, community, you feel bonded, you feel connected. So we see in um, the holotropic breathwork, people come for a week weekend workshop, they have never seen each other, and when they are leaving, you know, they feel really connected by having done this deep, deep work with each other. We have done this as uh, pre-conference workshops in uh, transpersonal uh, conferences, and we had groups of people coming from cultures that have, be, have had grudges with each other. You know, we had, uh, we had, in Europe we had sort of uh, all the Eastern European people and the, the Russians, and we had. Uh, Jews and Germans and so on. And, you know, all these different cultures have, have uh, major grudges and you can see how these boundaries, how they are melted when people really do some kind of uh, responsible, honest uh, work with each other. Uh, so then another one is, is the tremendous development of uh, racial, sexual, political and religious uh, tolerance. Uh, the other one is a uh, greater sense of uh, uh, inner peace, uh, increase of uh, self-image, self-acceptance. Uh, what um, um, Maslow uh, called uh, self-realization, self-actualization, uh, being guided more by what he calls meta-motivations, meta-values, discovering real sense for beauty, real sense for justice. Uh, uh, the next one, uh, this uh, reduction of these irrational drives uh, and ambitions and uh, appreciation, much more appreciation of the present moment. Not to be more aware of what we don't have, but more what, what we can do with what we, what we have. Um, the sense of uh, compet competitiveness is uh, replaced by uh, a sense of uh, synergy, of, of uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, what the Tao is called the Wu Wei, uh, which is the, usually translated as creative quietude. Different kind of a strategy of life when you don't pursue a linear goal, but more sort of go with where the energies are going and things that you achieve are achieved with less effort and usually in a way that also serves a, a larger purpose, not just the, the individual um, purpose. Um, something that was important with the work with cancer patients, the shift of emphasis from preoccupation with the past and concerns about the future, uh, focus on the present moment, you know, how am I doing today? I'm okay. Uh, tomorrow is going to be not another day rather than imagining the horrible things that will happen in the future. The same in working with uh, addicts or alcoholics, that being in the present is, as people know, in, in um, uh, the AA, uh, you know, this, the emphasis is on the, on the present moment. Can I stay sober today? Okay, I can. And tomorrow is going to be another day, not thinking about how you relapse in the, in the future. Uh, increase of zest that people describe, more, uh, more uh, joie de vivre, 
um, they develop a, a new way of, of uh, appreciating food, appreciating music, appreciating uh, uh, love making, appreciating nature, and so on. This is very, very characteristic for uh, responsible use with uh, psychedelics. Uh, another very important thing by having uh, transpersonal experiences, fe feeling uh, oneness with other forms of uh, life and other people and so on, uh, ecological, tremendous ecological awareness and, and wanting to do something for clean air, clean uh, water, clean earth. You don't have to teach people ecology, that just comes spontaneously from uh, transpersonal experiences. Uh, also, sense of planetary belonging. This is something that happened to also to astronauts, those people who had the possibility of seeing the, uh, it's called the blue planet, you know, the, the one beautiful planet uh, against the, the, the darkness and, and immense uh, dimensions of the, of the cosmic space. They just developed tremendous sense of uh, planetary belonging, the global citizens. When they came back, they felt it more important that they are uh, citizens of the planet than that they are Americans or Czechs or Russians. Uh, also, people discover, you know, what uh, Buckminster Fuller was, was calling the spaceship, spaceship uh, Earth. And the last thing I would like to mention is a form of spirituality that develops uh, as a result of responsible work with psychedelics, which is uh, non-sectarian, non-chauvinistic, uh, which is um, uh, universal, which is all-encompassing, uh, which is very different from what you see in, in relation to, uh, to um, organized religions. Joseph Campbell uh, used to say that the useful deity has to be transparent for the transcendent. It points to the absolute, but it's not absolute itself. He says, when you make the archetypes, the images opaque, then you create a situation where you bring together a group of people who are seeing it the same way, are willing to worship a certain way, but you also divide the, the world because you, you um, uh, set that group against another group. We are Christians, you know, you are pagans. Everybody has to be a Christian. We, we, have to convert you, or you know, there's no place for you. We are Muslims. You are infidels. So let's let's do you know, sacred war against the uh, infidels. Uh, you know, or we are we are uh, Jews, and you are going and so on. So the religion, organized religion today, is more of a problem in the world than part of the uh, part of the solution. A lot of the violence comes really from from. Uh, the religious differences, and not just between uh, organized religions, but also inside, you know, centuries of fight between Protestants and, and uh, uh, Catholics, uh, centuries of fight between the Sunnis and the Shiites. So, so that's not a very useful uh, religion. Religion is supposed to bind together, religio binding together what was fragmented. And this is the kind of spirituality that, that emerges spontaneously people who do some responsible work uh, with psychedelics. Um, so I think, I think I will end here. I've used my time. This is, this is a big topic and not, a, you know, not, not really enough time to cover all these things. But uh, just to sum it up in a few sentences, responsible use for psychedelics can really solve a lot of individual problems, can improve the quality of life in individuals. And I believe that uh, the kind of transformation that I, that I described that happens, if it could happen on a large scale, I think it would increase our uh, capacity for survival. Uh, I have seen it in hundreds of people individually. Now, whether we can do it on a large enough scale and whether we have enough time to do it, you know, it's an open question. But it's very exciting to know that there is a way that if we, if we so agree and if we try to put our energy there, that it could really make a difference. Probably the only thing that would make a difference. 
you know, because if we continue the, the uh, current uh, corrective measures, I think it just makes things worse. So thank you very much for your for your attention and answers.